If we take up Ralph Renee's challenge, we find that shadows aren't always parallel. Shadows are a very poor way of determining the direction of the light source. Because they tend to diverge and converge based on the shape of the object that casts them, and also because of the terrain that lies underneath them. These affect the direction of shadows as we see them. Skeptics also question the amount of detail visible in areas that should be in shade. Their explanation? A second light source has filled them in. Well, let's have a look at one of the most famous photographs of the 20th century, Man on the Moon. It was taken by Neil Armstrong of Buzz Aldrin on Apollo 11. Given that it's very harsh light, as you can see here, where it strikes directly, you would expect the shadow area to be virtually invisible. But it's not. But on our man-made lunar set, we can clearly see the reflective properties created by our only source of light. As you can see, there is only one light source in this entire picture, and it's behind us. According to the conspiracy theorists, this side of the astronaut should be in total shadow. But it isn't. What's happening? The light from the ground around us is being reflected back up toward the astronaut, and it's illuminating this portion of him. Another cause for suspicion among conspiracy theorists is the Apollo mission's American flag. Wherever there's an American flag, it's always brilliantly lit up, even if it's on the shadow side. And on the shadow side, that should be really dark black. But they had little spotlights, obviously, because that's the only way you can do it. Oh, gee, that's great. Is the lighting halfway decent? Conspiracy theorists say that it's suspicious for the flag to be brightly lit on both sides in all of the photographs. They say it should appear in shadow at some point. Here we can see our flag brightly lit from the front, but if we move around to the back, we can see that even with our single light source, it's still brightly lit. The light is shining through and making the flag glow. But what about the issue of the flag waving in an environment with no wind? When they were filming some of the flag scenes, they had air conditioners going to keep the astronauts cooler since they were wearing their little uh, space suits. So it's very possible that what we saw was wind. Is this waving flag the ultimate proof the landings were faked in a studio? On our moon set, Jay Windley plans to prove otherwise. The planting of the Apollo flag has given conspiracy theorists what they believe is their trump card. What I see is a flutter which is caused by variable wind pressures. So the picture could not have been taken on the moon no matter what the apologists say. Either that or the moon has a breeze. Despite all their preparations on Earth, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin didn't know what to expect as they got ready to plant the flag. Putting the flag on the moon was really a symbolic highlight of the mission. It was one that we had not really rehearsed. Uh, Neil knew where the flag was stowed. Uh, we brought it out, then we had to put the two pieces together. It won't go up. The astronauts had to drive the flagstaff into the hard lunar surface with a twisting motion. A horizontal aluminum rod kept the flag suspended. And this caused the free end of the flag to flip up and back in response to that. Also, this is an aluminum tube, very similar to the ones used on the Apollo mission. It's very springy. If I cause it to spring and then let go of it, we see that this motion continues long after I've let go of it. On Earth, air resistance dampens this pendulum motion. But on the lunar surface, there's no air to slow the flag and stop it from waving. Most obvious evidence the flag was on the moon and not in any air is that whenever people walked by it, it didn't move at all. It only moved when someone was working with the staff or letting go as it rocked back and forth. Conspiracy theorists point to another strange anomaly, one that can't be explained by lack of atmosphere. 
As the 16-ton landing craft touched down, its rockets should have blasted away the top layer of dust, exposing the rocky lunar surface. But clearly, footprints are visible beneath the spacecraft, and there seems to be no dust on the landing pads. In this enormously powerful jet of flame and heat and gas, it would have easily scooped up an enormous crater. In fact, there was supposition that the crater would have been so big that the lunar lander would have disappeared into it. <laughs> That's true. Ralph Rene has devised an experiment to illustrate his claim that the rocket-powered lander should have left a crater. By his calculations, the lunar module's rocket is 26 times more powerful than a garden leaf blower. And if this can leave a crater in a gravel pit, then so should a spacecraft with 10,000 pounds of thrust. They didn't move dry dust, they didn't move little rocks, they didn't move anything. So the demonstration is to show that this stuff will disappear immediately and I'll even be able to gouge some kind of a hole. Here we go. If Rene is correct, the lunar surface, like the gravel pit, would show visible signs of disturbance. When it actually landed, the dust was all still there. Now, how can that be? You know, if you blow dust away, it goes away, like I just did here. I swept the ground. But on approach, the Eagle had reduced its power to 25%. As it glided into land, the gentle forward motion further lessened the thruster's impact on the lunar surface. And a closer inspection of some of the photos reveals that the landing did, in fact, disturb a very fine layer of dust but not enough to cover the landing pads. But dust is not the only element missing from the photographic evidence. We'll continue with more National Geographic Channel presents after this. Sunday, earthquakes. For years, we've searched the universe for signs of life. On May 30th, make contact. Extraterrestrial, May 30th at 9 on the National Geographic Channel. Dare to explore. And now, back to National Geographic Channel presents. With no weather on the moon, one would expect a spectacular view of space. Yet there are no stars in the Apollo photographs. Back then, fortunately for me and us, who are trying to break this thing out the truth, they took no pictures of the stars. Bill Casing is convinced this was a conscious decision on NASA's part. Astronomers could have easily discerned that the, that the star positions were not those that would have appeared in a photograph taken from the moon. So it's another case where they could not fake it, so they simply ignored it. If you were to talk to Aldrin or Armstrong or any of the other uh, Apollo astronauts, they would actually not respond in any way to questions regarding stars. When you looked up at the sky, could you actually see the stars and the solar corona in spite of the glare? We were never able to see stars from the lunar surface or on the daylight side of the moon by eye without looking through the optics. I asked Neil Armstrong whether he saw stars because I knew everyone else was asking. I knew the answer, of course. The point is that your eyes aren't adapted to that. The human eye reacts to light by opening and closing the iris. In bright light, the iris becomes smaller. In the dark, it widens. On the moon, the eye, like the camera aperture, can't adjust to the brightness of the lunar surface and the darkness of space at the same time. If you were to stand in a floodlit stadium or under a street light in a city, you would have the same effect. If you looked up, you wouldn't see many stars at all. Even our own television camera can't adjust to the extreme contrast. On our moon set, Jay Windley plans an experiment in the hopes of disproving one of the conspiracy theorists' key arguments. We're going to find out that if we use an identical camera loaded with identical film and we shoot pictures of the night sky, we won't get stars. 
Will Jay's experiment be enough to invalidate the conspiracy theorists' arguments? The morning after the shoot, the negatives are developed at a professional processing laboratory in Los Angeles. In our experiment in the desert, we shot a variety of photographs using different film formats. In this 35 millimeter photograph, we see that the shadows of the crew members in our single light source very distinctly converge together. In fact, there's almost a 90 degree difference in, a, in the apparent shadow direction. In this photograph here, we see the effects of terrain on the shadows. The hills change the apparent direction of shadows. The astronaut's shadow here falls in one direction, 